Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today here at one of Burlington's new great institutions, Hula Lakeside. We really thought this was the perfect setting for today's discussion because the community here at Hula proves that through innovation and action, we can confront the realities of climate change together and create, and create new opportunities that will secure a vibrant local economy and a safer, more vibrant future for Burlington. When we announced our net zero energy roadmap in 2019, our goal was to create an ambitious, actionable plan to end our city's reliance on fossil fuels. We've always known that to achieve net zero, we would need to move quickly to embrace new technologies, ensure equity, and pioneer new policies to push the boundaries of what's possible. In 2020, we took a big step forward in that plan by launching the first green stimulus incentives program to boost both the city's economic recovery in the early stages of the pandemic and our transition to electric vehicles, heat pumps, bikes, lawn mowers, and more. I always find it kind of fun that we, if you want an electric forklift, we can help you with that too. Um, here's the thing with these incentives, they worked. Since announcing our first package of incentives for BED customers, residential cold climate heat pump installations increased by approximately 20 times. It's, and now, in 2023, it has never been easier or more affordable for Burlingtonians to electrify everything because of the major changes that have been made at a policy level, at the, at the national level. So through BED's robust local incentive program, combined with the new state and federal support flowing from the historic Inflation Reduction Act, in many cases, Burlingtonians can now transition their home heating to electric for a lower monthly cost than they currently pay, or buy and fuel power a new electric vehicle for a lower monthly cost than driving a new gas-powered car. And new this year, BED has launched an on-bill financing program with VHFA for low and moderate income renters and homeowners to weatherize their homes and install heat pumps, giving a whole new way for Burlingtonians to electrify their homes. While, <clears throat> while the net zero programs and services BD offers, offers lead the nation, we know that incentives alone won't get us to the finish line. That's why we fought hard for new regulatory authority in the legislature last year for the city to have the ability to regulate building energy, which is the largest single source of carbon emission in our city. <clears throat> on town meeting day in 2021, more than 64% of Burlington voters approved a charter change to allow the city to use a price-based system to regulate buildings to ensure that they are designed to use renewable energy for heating, which avoids costly future retrofits and reduces fossil fuel use in Burlington. <clears throat> Since then, we've worked to quickly exercise this new authority and we'll be bringing back to voters this town meeting day a new proposal as was required in that charter change a year ago, a new proposal to require all new construction to be renewable and that city buildings and large commercial buildings only replace heating and hot water systems with renewable technology or else pay a reasonable fee that correctly reflects the true cost of carbon pollution. So let me say again, this, this, this vote that will be before people in just a few weeks when the voting begins in, in early February through town meeting day, um, would create this new science-based reasonable fee to capture the true cost of pollution for new construction and for city buildings and large commercial buildings that are uh, replacing their heating and hot water systems. Climate leaders across the country and around the globe agree that to accelerate market changes and encourage the adoption of renewal technologies, governments need to use both carrots and sticks. That is what we're doing here by first making it as affordable and appealing as possible to go electric and power your home or business with 100% renewable energy. And now, so that, that, that's, the, that's the carrot part, which we've had for years and which are very significant incentives and now by introducing a fair science-based impact fee that would cover the real lifetime impact of any new fossil fuel infrastructure in those categories I just laid out. 
Together, these pioneering policies will push forward the urgent change we need to realize a net zero future. You're gonna hear in a moment from some of our other speakers today just how awesome that future is going to be. Um, I'm gonna make, uh, just, I just wanna make one final point in closing. Last year, the federal government passed a historic piece of climate legislation intended to move the country off fossil fuels, the Inflation Reduction Act. <clears throat> Um, uh, that, that act was in, in, in the, 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 the um, idea behind that act is we're going to move away from fossil fuels by increasing renewables, electrifying everything, and in doing that, we're going to end the climate emergency. Now it's up to state and local leaders to implement much of this transformative and critical vision. And we are poised to do exactly that. With a yes vote, on this ballot item to create a science-based carbon pollution impact fee combined with the aggressive local electrification incentives we've already created, Burlington will have a powerful combination of tools to make good on this critical effort and to show other communities how to get to net zero. So thank you for being here today and hear about this. We have a lot of other people to, uh, to, to share their perspective and then we'll be happy to take some questions. Next up, uh, General Manager of the Burlington Electric Department, um, uh, someone uh, who I feel so fortunate to, to have in this role, on, especially on days like today when we are uh, working to innovate new, uh, uh, new climate policy changes. I'm not, I don't think there's another uh, general manager of a public utility in the country that is more skilled and effective at this than, than Darren Springer. So excited to, uh, and proud and grateful to be able to work with you in this way, Darren. So thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we have a powerhouse lineup of speakers here uh, that I'm excited, uh, both uh, virtual and, and here uh, in person, I'm excited to turn it over to. Uh, before we do that, uh, we were going to run through a few slides uh, just about what the ballot item is and what the proposal is. Um, and so I think we're going to be able to get those on the screen here. Um, and we'll go to the first slide. And this just talks about what was the time frame for all of this. So what we're bringing uh, forward now and what's going to be on the ballot uh, town meeting day has been the result of a few years of process uh, really starting back in October of 2020 uh, when the mayor and the administration including Burlington Electric Department uh, Department of Permitting and Inspections uh, brought forward a building electrification proposal and a portion of that proposal has since been implemented as an ordinance uh, which is requiring for new construction that we have renewable heating uh, as the primary heating system. And that's been put in place that is current policy in the city of Burlington. But what we found out was a portion of that proposal also required a charter change in order specifically to implement the carbon pollution impact fee. And so uh, as the mayor laid out, we had a town meeting day vote in 2021. We had the legislature and the governor approve uh, the charter change. Um, and then since May of 2022, uh, our department and our colleagues at the Department of Permitting and Inspections have been working to bring forward a proposal for the city and the city council to consider. Um, so we've issued reports in, in July and December, um, and the December report is the basis for some of the policy proposals that we'll be discussing today. Um, we can move to the next slide. So um, what was in the uh, process that led up to that? We had a variety of stakeholder meetings with different folks uh, who uh, would be impacted by the policy. Uh, we went to all of the different NPAs around the city to share some of our thoughts. Uh, myself, my colleague Jen Green, who's here, and Chris Burns, who's here, uh, worked on this at Burlington Electric, along with Bill Ward, who's going to speak in a moment, and Patty Wayman at the Department of Permitting and Inspections. Um, we worked with colleagues uh, from the Building Electrification Institute, who you're going to hear from as well, um, which is a national group that works with cities and communities uh, around the country on building electrification and climate policy. And so we had a lot of process and a lot of thinking going into the report that was issued. Uh, next slide, please. Really, really critical point. What is covered and what is not covered uh, under the proposed policy? So buildings that would be covered include new construction, uh, proposed start date of January 1, 2024, large existing buildings, and really there are about 80 buildings in the city that are over 50,000 square feet that would be covered under the large existing buildings portion, and then city buildings, uh, municipal buildings that are owned and operated by the city which means what's not covered here is all existing residential buildings, whether that's single family home, uh, rental, condo, affordable housing, 
all small businesses, and then all other buildings that are under 50,000 square feet. So this is a very, very focused proposal that's looking at new construction and large existing buildings and city buildings. Uh, next slide, please. So the recommendations for new construction are really to be 100% renewable. Uh, and this kind of builds on that existing ordinance that I mentioned, but goes further. Uh, the idea here is if we have the goal of becoming a net zero energy city by 2030, we need all new construction to be 100% renewable. And that means not only the heating system and the water heating system, uh, but the cooking, the clothes drying, all the different thermal uses that we think of in a building would be renewable under this policy or as an alternative compliance option, if a building was not able to be renewable, there would be a carbon impact fee at the time of permitting that would be assessed to account for the pollution impact from using a conventional system. Um, renewable is a fairly broad definition, uh, and this is very consistent with what the state is considering uh, for the Affordable Heating uh, Act, or the Clean Heat Standard, as it's been called previously. Uh, we're talking about all the different electric options, including geothermal, which is used here at Hula, and we're going to hear from Russ about that in, in a few moments, uh, heat pumps of all different types, um, as well as other renewable fuel sources, all can count towards this definition. And then if the building doesn't use those, then the carbon fee would apply. Uh, next slide, please. Um, similarly, for large existing buildings, there would be a requirement starting in January of 2024 that if the building goes to replace an existing heating system or an existing water heating system, that the building would use renewable technologies or fuels to replace those systems or would be subject to the carbon fee uh, as well. And we're looking at options to make some of a portion of the carbon fee available if an existing building pays in, uh, that the building could get some of that back to be able to utilize uh, that for emissions reduction projects at their campus or at their facility. Um, and there would also be credit for actions that the building takes outside of the scope of the policy. If they go further than what we're asking to reduce fossil fuel use, there would be credit associated with that under the policy. So back to the carrot and sticks uh, concept that, that was mentioned earlier. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what would the carbon pollution impact fee proceeds go towards? Um, what we have are three different potential options, one of which I just mentioned, which is for existing buildings, they could get a portion of the fee back for use on emissions reduction at their own building. There are two other primary uses that are contemplated. One is to support the city fleet in moving from fossil fuel vehicles to electric vehicles, uh, which benefits all taxpayers in the city as we save money on operating those fossil fuel vehicles by moving to electric. And then second, and, and critically important, uh, and consistent with advisory question seven from the town meeting day ballot in 2021, uh, an option to have a new uh, low income clean heating fund that the city would administer uh, to improve access to clean heat technologies for low income Burlingtonians, both households and renters. Um, so those are the primary purposes uh, of the use of the fee. Uh, next slide, please. What we're going to run through now, uh, just briefly, are a few examples of analysis that we did with the Building Electrification Institute that look at the costs of the different options that are available. Uh, this slide here looks at a real building uh, that was uh, built in the city, 150,000 square feet, multifamily, new construction building, and compares the cost of a fossil fuel system uh, and, and also a fossil fuel system with the carbon fee applied. Uh, those are the, the first two bars on the left with different renewable technologies from an upfront capital standpoint and demonstrates that a variety of the renewable technologies are cost competitive with the baseline system as is and that when you apply the carbon fee, you level the playing field even further. You make it even more clear that the renewable option is the cost effective option. Uh, next slide, please. We also looked at operating costs, uh, looking at current electric and gas rates in the city. And this is uh, operating cost for that same um, multifamily building. This looks at a uh, tenant metered uh, building. Sometimes the tenant has the meter. Sometimes there's a single meter for the building. We'll, we'll do both. Uh, in this example, as you can see, uh, all of the renewable options are cheaper to operate uh, than the uh, typical multifamily uh, baseline system and also uh, cost competitive or cheaper uh, than the uh, new construction uh, gas baseboard system. Um, so what we're really looking at here is there can be an operating cost advantage with renewable technologies relative to fossil fuels. Uh, next slide, please. 
In this example, which is the same building, but looking at it as a single meter as opposed to the tenant each having their own meter, uh, there are some differences. Uh, but as you can see, the renewable options in green are largely cost competitive with the typical, uh, which is on the left here, the typical uh, existing multifamily building system. Uh, there are some cases where uh, the uh, baseline new construction system is a little cheaper as conventional, but largely making the same point that on an operating cost basis, renewable can be cost competitive with fossil fuels. Uh, next slide, please. One last operating cost example. Uh, this looks at a 60,000 square foot office building, uh, again, in the city, looking at a new construction office building and looking at uh, different heat pump and geothermal options and showing that uh, in most cases, the renewable option is gonna be cheaper to operate based on current rates than the fossil fuel system. Um, and that's really, that's a recent development uh, where electric rates have been relatively stable, uh, gas costs have gone up significantly, and so we have a price advantage now with renewable, with electric that we didn't have maybe a few years ago. And then our last slide uh, here uh, looks at one more capital cost comparison. Uh, this is for an upfront capital cost if you were uh, an existing building, and this looks at a real building again in the city uh, that's about 50,000 square feet and looks at what the baseline fossil fuel system replacement would cost, and then looks at it with the carbon fee compared to the various renewable options. And what you can see is the carbon fee here really makes a difference. Uh, this is an example where if we don't have a carbon pollution impact fee, uh, it might be cheaper upfront to go with a fossil fuel system. But when we account for the health and environmental impacts of the fossil fuel use through that fee, and then we'd make the comparison with the dark gray bar versus all of the green bars, the renewable systems are all more cost competitive. And that really, at the end of the day, is what this policy is about, is about trying to make sure that we're accounting for all of the externalities associated with fossil fuel use, and then comparing on a level playing field, renewable options versus fossil fuel options. So uh, really pleased to be able to run through those slides. And as the mayor said, we'll be glad to answer some questions uh, at the end. Um, but I am going to help MC the rest of the uh, speakers and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my colleague, Bill Ward from the Department of Permitting and Inspections. Uh, Bill's department would be uh, the enforcement uh, arm of the city when it comes to this policy. So uh, Bill, please uh, come Thank on you, up. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have a few brief comments. I wanted to make sure people knew first that I am Bill Ward. I'm the director of the Permitting and Inspections Department. It's a relatively new department, but uh, it's the important gateway department for projects coming into compliance with the policies you've heard described today. And as such, in 2021, we instituted an online permitting system. The software system is uh, simplified, it makes it so much easier for a typical applicant to both apply for and receive approval for permits. It's my job and it's my pledge to make sure that that continues with what you've heard as a policy described today. We will work with property owners, with applicants who come forward with a permit. If they meet those requirements uh, for um, energy systems as you've heard described, or if they're like this wonderful building we're in today, um, those projects will move quick, quickly and move forward. The others, the secondary part would be if they don't meet those, our team would work closely with the applicant and with Darren's team to see that they can comply and meet the requirements and would potentially pay that uh, carbon impact fee if that becomes necessary. But we will work with property owners and applicants in all cases like we have been doing. We're excited to work on this project, not only for the applicants, but also for the betterment of everyone who lives, works, and recreates in Burlington. It makes it a better place for all of us. We're excited as a department. I'm personally excited and happy to be a part of this project. Thank you, Bill. Sure. Thanks, Bill. Um, next up in our powerhouse lineup, uh, we have Russ Scully uh, from Hula, and we wanna thank Hula for hosting this event today and uh, for being such a great example of what renewable heating and renewable technologies look like in the city. Uh, so Russ, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks for, for being with us virtually. I'm happy to be here and sorry I can't be there in person. Thanks everyone for, um, well, I appreciate this initiative and I, I really, I want to uh, congratulate everyone for pulling this off and presenting this information in such a clear, concise manner. Um, yeah, we're, I, I can personally say we're, all of us at Hula are very proud of um, really the efficiencies that we realize, uh, some of the goals that we set out to, to obtain from an energy efficiency standpoint as well 
well as a you know carbon um, carbon offset or, or mitigation plan and, and strategy and I got to say that you know we had a lot of help in this you know everyone understands the real cost the development costs uh, associated with a project like this um, it, was, it was great to see some of the examples of some of the renewable costs in comparison to some of the fossil fuel based infrastructural costs as a comparison that's, that's really helpful to see you know, we had a lot of help from Burlington Electric we had a lot of help from the, the team at LM Consulting they really helped us to model sort of the long-term financial efficiencies that we would realize from taking some of the steps that we did to not only install the geothermal heating system that we're really proud of that's been incredible to, 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 to not only to work with but you know the long-term maintenance costs of these systems are are, are much less significant than the, than the comparables of the old fossil fuel based system that that came out of this building and were replaced by the uh, the geothermal wells that are heating and cooling the space now um, the realization of all the renewable energy that we were able to put in place uh, with the 800 kilowatt array that's on the rooftops of the whole of buildings has been fantastic. The realization of peak shaving and all kinds of other sort of uh, solar strategies that, that buildings like Lula can put in place to really minimize their um, how much how much energy we're actually consuming. And um, you know the point that was brought up earlier is a real one. You know the. The, the, the realization and the reality of installing and separately metering all of these tenants is a lot of unnecessary capital expenditure, unnecessary work, a lot of additional maintenance that just goes away when um, we're able to build a system that essentially allows us to pass a lot of the savings, a lot of the energy saving for heating and cooling and, and electrification onto all the tenants in the building. And at the same time, it's not, you know, and this is all stuff that we feel good about because obviously it's better for the environment. But, um, but it, it's also, it, it's, it's future forward as well. If you're going to go through a large scale renovation and rehabilitation like we did in this old industrial building, it's, it's an easy win in terms of finding efficiencies that um, just really modernize the building but make it just a much more comfortable place to live and to work and, and to ultimately finance. So thanks again for being in the building with us today. Again, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm really excited about this initiative and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Russ. Thank you so much for, for allowing us to be here today to hold the event. Uh, we're really honored to be joined by three Burlington High School seniors who have been part of the City and Lake program uh, and who are thinking a lot about climate change. Uh, Shinoa, Finley, and Vivian, I'd like to invite you up to say a few words. Thanks for being here. Of course, yeah, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Finley. Um, I'm really glad to be here and be able to give my opinion. Um, I feel like a lot of the times as minors we're not, there's a lot of stress put on us of course about climate change because this is a big issue and it's going to be our future um, and we don't really get much of a chance to make much of an impact um, you know, we can't vote yet. Um, so initiatives like this are really, really um, just give me a lot of hope for the future. They, it's, it's great to see that there are steps being taken towards this, well, a sustainable future. And it's not going to be a problem that I'm going to have to deal with solely by myself. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, like Finley said, I, um, I've lived in Burlington my whole life. And I think as a young adult and an activist, it is hard to sit back and want to do more, but seeing um, pieces of legislation being introduced uh, this quickly and seeing our goals for Burlington has been really insp inspirational and really hopeful, and I'm really excited to see what comes next. Thank you awesome. so much. Thank you for being here, guys. Yeah. That's great. Thanks for joining us. <clears throat> Um, we're going to go back from in-person to virtual for a moment. Uh, we have two colleagues from the Building Electrification Institute are on with us, uh, Christina Garcia and Katie campbell Orek, who have been working uh, very closely with the Burlington Electric team uh, on these proposals and a variety of other work in the city. So I'm going to turn it over to Christina and Katie. Thank you for being with us. Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christina Garcia with the Building Electrification Institute and I'm thrilled to be a part of today's exciting news. 
Our mission at BEI is to equip cities and communities with the knowledge, skills, and resources they need to co-create ambitious and equitable strategies to accelerate the transition toward fossil fuel-free buildings. Since our founding in 2018, BEI has had the pleasure of working with the Burlington Electric Department, providing technical assistance and economic analyses while elevating innovative best practices in equitable building electrification to help achieve Burlington's 2030 net zero energy commitment. Burlington and BEI share commitment to equitable and meaningful community engagement, such as hearing directly from stakeholders, especially those impacted, has led to the development of innovative and pioneering policies such as this one. Today's announcement of Burlington's carbon pollution impact fee provides a tremendous opportunity for the community to experience the benefits of electrification while continuing to develop the local workforce and improve public health and safety. We are honored to work alongside Burlington during, during the development of this policy, which demonstrates such leadership in the space. At BEI, we work with cities across the country, including Boston, New York City, and Denver, who are implementing similar policies to encourage electrification, even in cold climates. And we are so excited to see Burlington join this ambitious cohort of cities. Thank you again, and I will now pass to my colleague, Katie. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Katie campbell Ora. Um, as Christina said, we at BEI are just so excited to see this proposed policy in Burlington. As we take a look at what it will take to reach Burlington's 2030 net zero goal, we recognize that a wide range of policies and support programs, the carrot and sticks that folks are talking about, um, will need to be will, will be needed to strategically electrify all buildings. Uh, this includes building on policies Burlington has already passed, including last year's innovative renewable heating ordinance for new construction and the re rental weatherization ordinance to improve energy efficiency for renters. Uh, voters will get to decide whether to implement a carbon fee for Bur Burlington's existing large commercial buildings, such a crit critical sector of Burlington's building stock. Uh, to encourage electrification when it makes most economic and practical sense for building owners. Uh, charging the carbon pollution fee is also an opportunity for the city to direct some new investments uh, to under-resourced buildings within the community, ensuring that funding is available for those who would benefit most from transitioning to clean electricity, but are least able to afford it. So not only is this necessary to reach our climate goals, but it also ensures that low-income and frontline communities do not get left behind in this transition. So BEI will continue to work alongside Burlington Electric Department uh, to create solutions for all buildings that will bring the, the health, the safety, workforce, and climate benefits um, of electrification to all of Burlingtonians. So thank you again, and we congratulate the Burlington team for getting this policy before voters this year. Thank you so much, Christina and Katie. Thank you for your partnership. Uh, we really appreciate you joining the event today. And um, we also have some great environmental and renewable energy leaders with us, and we're going to hear from them now, starting with Johanna Miller from VNRC. Johanna. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, everyone. Um, Johanna Miller, I work at the Vermont Natural Resources Council. We're a statewide environmental education and advocacy organization. Um, in my role leading the energy and climate program work, I also have the opportunity and the privilege uh, to work with communities across the state through the Vermont Energy and Climate Action Network who are very interested in and doing important partnership with their communities. And I think very interested in this proposal and the work happening here in Burlington as a model for what communities um, can and should be doing and for all the benefits that these kinds of um, opportunities um, can provide. So I'm really glad to be here with you today. Um, one of the hats I wear is also a member of the Vermont Climate Council, which is charged with um, developing a plan to help the state of Vermont meet its climate um, pollution reduction requirements and the partnership of communities, especially the largest city in the state of Vermont, is really important to our progress and our ability to do that. So I just want to say that I'm excited to be here to celebrate and support um, Burlington, the city, the, the electric department, um, the leadership you are taking and taking responsibility for acting on the existential threat of climate change. Um, I applaud your commitment to net zero by 2030 and to actually falling through with the kind of planning programs and policies that actually turn goals 
into realistic outcomes and achievable results. So it's a refreshing in a world where we set a lot of goals and we too often lack um, the will or the ability to follow through with those goals um, by doing what, delivering what we say we're going to delivering on. So Burlington's have, Burlingtonians have long made clear, and I hope they will again with, a vote, with this vote on, on town meeting, that they take their responsibility to act on climate very seriously. They recognize both the moral obligation and the opportunity. We heard a tremendous amount from previous speakers about the public health, economic, equity enhancing benefits of a proposal like this. So we not only support and commend Burlington's commitment and leadership in this arena, um, but the fact is that the technology has evolved so much. Um, we have cost effective, affordable, cleaner heating measures and this proposal is going to help Burlingtonians, especially lower income um, Burlingtonians who can least afford uh, to pay more for their energy, to stay warm, be able to access, access those resources. So I think it's a really important proposal and we are very grateful to be here supporting you in making this um, a reality and demonstrating all the benefits that it can afford to the city of Burlington, Burlingtonians, and setting an example for um, what we can do as a state. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, we are also pleased to be joined by Peter Sterling, who is the Executive Director of Renewable Energy Vermont and was part of the effort to pass the charter change in the legislature in 2022. So Peter, thank you for being here. Hi, my name is Peter Sterling. I'm the Executive Director of Renewable Energy Vermont. We're the trade association representing the hundreds of businesses that work in the renewable energy field here in Vermont. We really appreciate Mayor Weinberger and BD's continued pursuit of strategic electrification as a critical strategy for combating climate change. While we support, as a first choice, the installation of renewable energy systems, we also recognize the positive impact a carbon, -free, a carbon fee will have in Burlington. This effort, combined with BED's continued commitment to maintaining a 100% renewable energy portfolio, should serve as a model in the fight against climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Peter. And uh, we have with us Paul Burns, Executive Director of VPIRG, which was an organization that championed the ballot initiative in 2021 and supported the charter change efforts in the legislature. We're really grateful to have you here with us, Paul. Thanks, Thanks for being here. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Well, thanks, uh, Darren, again, Mr. Mayor, appreciate it. I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, as Darren said, VPIRG is a Vermont Public Interest Research Group. We're the largest consumer and environmental advocacy organization in Vermont, and we have thousands of members right here in Burlington. Um, two years ago, our members, staff, volunteers, and students uh, we're glad to be part of that process to help pass uh, the ballot questions that really uh, came to fruition or are coming fruition uh, in this plan that you've been hearing about today. I'm particularly uh, grateful to have students here participating in this process. I think that is so critically important. You didn't cause the problem. Um, we and others did, and I um, appreciate your being part of the solution, and, and don't stop, you know. Keep the pressure on every step of the way. It is absolutely essential. Uh, but those ballot questions uh, in two, two years ago uh, were about giving Burlington the ability to better chart its own course uh, on climate action and climate justice. Specifically, we supported the Burlington uh, uh, rental weatherization standards and primary renewable heating systems for new construction. And today, VPIRG applauds the city's continued progress in this area. This is what leadership looks like, and we are happy to see it. While we may be closer than ever to having statewide energy policy that will move toward a heating sector uh, away from fossil fuels and toward cleaner heating options that are more affordable, uh, cities like Burlington going further and faster, this is absolutely critical to that process. Simply put, it helps to have people with the courage and foresight to go first to prove not only that it can be done, but that it can be done in a responsible, sustainable, and just way. That focus on just policy is one uh, not, that makes clean heating technologies available to all residents of Burlington, including those at lower incomes, and that's critically important. 
It's also consistent with the advisory question that Darren mentioned uh, as well, question seven in 2021, uh, that directed the city to look at policies um, as we move away from fossil fuels uh, for heating that prioritize Burlington's that are BIPOC or lower income or moderate income. Heating and cooling buildings, as you have heard, is a huge source of climate pollution in Vermont and in Burlington. And far too many Vermonters continue to struggle to afford the high cost of energy. As the state's largest city, Burlington is playing an outsized role in cutting carbon pollution here in Vermont. It's great to see the city leading the way in helping Vermonters transition to affordable, clean alternatives to fossil fuels. So thanks again for the leadership. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, I just want to um, uh, close by uh, saying uh, I really appreciate all of you being here and being part of this. You know, this, what we've laid out today, we are on the cusp of doing, but it, it's going to require a majority of Burlingtonians to um, <clears throat> support this action, support the creation of this new fee on town meeting day. And uh, I really appreciate you all being here to show the breadth of the coalition that uh, supports this uh, action. Um, I'm going to be very active from now <clears throat> until town meeting day, making sure um, that every Burlingtonian who's tuning into this is really understands um, what this important initiative is about. Um, <clears throat> with that, I think we're ready to take a few questions if you have some. Go ahead. Excellent. Yeah, let me walk you through it. So, and the, it is confusing. There's a lot of, there's really a number of different policies that are all sort of working together here. Great. Um, <clears throat> first of all, um, I think you were, I think you may have been with us when we were with the Burlington Electric Department a few weeks ago. There, since 2019, we've had a set of uh, incentives, uh, financial incentives at the local level, which you can now part, <clears throat> kind of marry up with state and federal incentives that make moving in this direction, whether with electric vehicles or a whole range of uh, devices and buildings better. And that's it's important to understand that not, that is established and that's there. And um, any building owner who's considering electrifying their building or building a new building, all that, we, we, the, see, the Burlington Electric Department wants to work closely with those building owners to make sure they're maximizing those incentives. We also do have an existing policy that does already uh, have a certain amount of requirements in it for new construction um, uh, regarding primary heating, heating sources. Um, so there is some regulation that's already on the books that really pushes people, pushes builders, new construction in the direction of electric heat. <clears throat> what is new and what, um, you know, I appreciate the question because I really want, this is important for everyone to be clear on, we want to go beyond the existing policies and create what we are calling a carbon pollution impact fee to apply to new construction in large buildings, 50,000 feet or more, uh, uh, that are going through at the time that they're upgrading their systems, upgrading heating systems, hot water systems, and to government buildings. Uh, if uh, town meeting day voters in Burlington support the creation of this new fee, that will be a new policy that comes out of, out of this vote. And that will uh, be a um, further rule essentially in place that will require builders that fall into those categories, property owners that fall into those categories, they will have a choice at the time of um, when, they, when they're making a decision, they can either uh, put in place all renewable technologies, non-fossil fuel burning technologies, and, uh, and we will help them financially do that. Or if for whatever reason it is just not practical or affordable uh, for the specific system that they need to build to, uh, to go in the renewable direction, the, 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 you know, the, the electric fossil fuel free direction, we, then there will be this one time upfront fee that they will be expected to pay. Please. Great. The city will collect the fees. The Burlington Electric Department will collect the f Well, actually, I guess the, that's why we have Bill here. Bill's going to collect the fees. Bill awarded the Department of Permitting Inspections, and 
um, there are three potential uses of the, those fees, that, and it will depend. There will be some um, one option for some uh, property owners will be to uh, have their fee applied um, uh, within their property to um, uh, other improvements that reduce their fossil fuel. Um, uh, usage and you know, Darren you know, could, could give an example of that. If if they don't go that route and, this, and the fee is collected by the city, then um, we will either use it to improve the, uh, the 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 city's vehicle fleet. We are trying to electrify the vehicle fleet, or and some of the money will go into a fund that will help low income. Uh, Burlingtonians uh, move towards electrification themselves. So, do you want to make sure that's points clear, Darren? That, that's that's accurate. Um, you know, just a little bit on your prior question. So, current policy is is renewable primary heating system for new construction, but that means there's a lot of uh, uses that are not covered currently. Uh, you could have a backup fossil fuel system uh, for heating. You could have a fossil fuel water heating system, fossil fuel cooking, uh, appliances, other appliances could use fossil fuel. So this proposal is really to address that full suite of building energy use uh, and go beyond what we currently have, which is just for the primary heating system. Um, and, and to give an example, if the fee was uh, used by an existing building to make emission reduction improvements, uh, if they were uh, to happen, they could do things like maybe they would put in uh, electric lawn equipment for their building, or maybe they would uh, put in electric vehicle charging stations, or make other improvements to the energy efficiency of the building. Anything that would really reduce fossil fuel use on site is something that I think we would be interested in, in helping to support. Go for it. Um, so you're saying in this proposal, in these slides, that building electric is going to be affordable, essentially. A lot of people don't believe that. That's something that it, building electric is expensive. Do you think that this is going to help our economy? Do you think people will want to move here and take their businesses here when, I mean, electric is expensive? So uh, it's a great question. Um, I think. What we're seeing with a lot of the electric technologies, particularly when we think about heating, um, is it's really only in the last decade that heat pump technology has been used for cold climates like Vermont. And what we're seeing is the cost of that technology is becoming more affordable and there's more options. Uh, so we have you know, mini split heat pumps that are going in a lot of residential homes and we have rooftop variable refrigerant flow heat pumps that can be used for commercial buildings. Uh, we have air to water heat pumps, which is an emerging technology. Uh, we have geothermal or ground source heat pumps, which is what we have here at Hula. And I think when you're building new in particular, uh, before you make the decision to connect to a fossil fuel system to invest in that infrastructure, what we're showing is that it can be very cost competitive uh, from an upfront capital perspective to invest in an electric or renewable heating system as opposed to a fossil fuel heating system. And then more recently, we've seen that the price to operate uh, the electric or renewable system is becoming very, very cost competitive uh, with natural gas or with fossil fuels. So I think the dynamic really has shifted. Um, and when we think about electric heat, we have to make sure we're not talking about the old resistance electric heat that was in buildings in the 70s and 80s and was not as efficient as heat pump technology because that would be expensive to operate. So what we're talking about is really the newer, more efficient, cold climate uh, heat pump technologies. Yeah, and, and I think we can, um, you know, we have the slides that we presented. Um, the slides at the end, and we'll make sure that you have a uh, link to them as well, um, really do show kind of, and it shows with the carbon fee and without the carbon fee, what the fossil fuel system uh, cost is relative to uh, heat pump systems, geothermal systems, uh, both to operate and to install. And I think what we're seeing is, is really that there is a cost competitive approach. Um, and really new construction is a great opportunity because again, you're, you're putting in a new building, you're connecting to new systems. That's a really important decision because you're making a 20 to 25 year decision right then. What kind of system are you gonna have? Is it gonna be using fossil fuels or is it gonna be renewable? And I think we need to make sure that as many buildings that are going in are using renewable as possible uh, because we have an ambitious 2030 goal uh, we can't reach it if buildings are continuing to add fossil fuel uh, systems. That's part of the, the policy approach. Here's, here's one of the slides, for example. 
just want to add one thing on this point. I mean, I like your, your question, I, I think a lot of people do assume that electric technologies are much more expensive, you know, because not that long ago they, they were. When, you know, if you were looking at an electric car a few years ago, uh, y you know, you had to be willing to pay a very substantial premium um, in order to go with an electric vehicle. As the last press conference showed, we're now in a situation where you can get a new car with all the incentives that are involved. You can get, you know, a brand new Chevy Bolt for, you know, if you're living in Burlington and using all the incentives available to you right now, the way the regulations are right now, you can get a car for fifteen thousand dollars. The these kind of price shifts and and changes in public policy that change the cost to the end user are are happening all the time. They're moving very quickly. They're changing. Uh, frequently, and you know, to take another example, you look at the cost of solar. Ten years ago, you know, there's been a 90% reduction in the cost of solar to, over just a decade. Something like 99% if you go back a few more decades since then. So, I, I, one of the things I like about this new policy, I think, is important about the policy is it um, ensures that as builders of new construction, large building owners, you know, in general, people, uh, uh, developers, builders who have um, uh, some capacity and some sophistication and financial analysis it ensures that they are stopping analyzing what the costs of uh, the technologies are today to electrify. And I think in many cases, people are going to be surprised by how competitive um, it is. The, the fee kind of demands that people take that analysis, take that step and check it out. In the, there are still situations where electric technologies are a lot more expensive. And in those situations, um, uh, which are getting less and less all the time. But in those situations, when it, when, another thing that I like and I think is important about this policy is it, it has flexibility in it. It says, okay, in those situations where it really is dramatically more expensive to use electric technology, you can use the conventional system and pay a modest fee uh, to, to do that. And that fee will be used to, to have other environmental benefits. So I, you know, I think this is, um, there are places that have just gone and sort of banned fossil fuel infrastructure outright. I actually think this is a more pragmatic uh, way to, to move forward on climate policy than some of those other uh, extreme policies. Hey, Darren, can I add just one thing there? Yeah. The, Mr. Mayor, thank you. I, I just wanted to also add that there is, of course, a real cost associated with burning fossil yeah. fuels for Thanks. heating. And, and everybody here has kind of alluded to that as well. And this is just one way of trying to actually capture it because those costs are, are not currently paid when you are buying fossil fuel to heat your home or to get around in a vehicle. Um, but this is one way to try to begin to internalize some of those costs to make them more fair and honest, honestly, uh, to, to uh, then help to drive a decision-making process that would undoubtedly move people away from those polluting, dangerous, and indeed expensive fossil fuels. So thanks. So one of the interesting things here when we're thinking about new construction is there might be a particular system that's, as the mayor just described, that might be really, you know, uh, not a good example where, where the technology wasn't there and where somebody chooses to pay the fee, um, but it's going to apply in new construction to all the systems. So it may be that you, you are able to do it for your heating system. Uh, but maybe you're not able to do it for uh, an appliance. And so you could pay the fee just on that portion of the, you know, of the building that's using the fossil fuel, just that system, and the rest of the systems could be mitigated. So you have every incentive in every decision, essentially, uh, to go with renewable if you're able to, and every economic incentive to go renewable. And then if you find a scenario where it doesn't make sense, uh, then you have the ability, as the mayor just laid out, to pay the fee and go with a conventional system. But the idea is it's very much applies to every kind of decision within the building. It's not a all or nothing proposition. Boston and Denver. So who have you, where are you in that matrix? And 
who do you use or what cities do you use as a model and who do you see as being um, a mentoring entity in the future for you, for Berkeley? Yeah, and I think uh, we still have Christina and Katie, and I might ask if they want to uh, chime in on this. Um, what we really did with our report was look at other cold climate cities that are taking steps, that are uh, looking at using carbon pricing. And I think we mentioned New York and Denver and Boston that all are either looking at carbon fees and or performance standards. And so it's really helpful to have a cold climate uh, city to compare ourselves to. Um, and I think, uh, you know, another city that's doing some things uh, along the same type of scale that we are is Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, we had the first net zero 2030 goal, and I think they've got the second one, as far as I'm aware, uh, in the country. So we've had some communication with them. And I know that the mayor, through both the Rewiring America, Mayors for Electrification, and other mayors groups, uh, Mayors Climate Coalitions, has communications with a variety of cities. Uh, but maybe I'd ask if, I don't know if Christina or Katie, if you can place Burlington within the context of some of the other communities that are working on this. For, yeah, as I mentioned, BEI currently works with 12 cities across the country. Um, but I would say that, you know, Burlington is in our, you know, am ambitious uh, kind of leading cohort that are tackling policies for existing buildings. A lot of our, our cities have already passed policies in new construction uh, because as, been, as it's been mentioned, we have found that building all electric is, is cost comparable um, to building with conventional. And so now they're tackling the, the much more difficult um, cohort of existing buildings. And so, yeah, Burlington is, is, is up there with, you know, New York City, Denver, and, and Boston who have passed similar policies addressing those buildings. Um, and, and we think, you know, allow those for, our, for their, their residents in existing buildings to start experiencing the benefits of electrification. Thank you. I think Christina answered that well. I'll just add, you know, um, part of BEI's role in Burlington is to make sure that we're pulling lessons learned from across cities. So we bring in tenants of things like community engagement and how to equitably spend um, the funds once Burlington has um, funds from the fees. So there are things that are true as good practices across all cities, but then this policy definitely we tailored it to the, the local context of Burlington and what makes sense for Burlington buildings, uh, your climate, and uh, what we heard from stakeholders. So that's why this is uh, pretty unique, even though it's kind of in the same basket as other cities' approaches. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Katie. Thanks what I love you. about Vermont and, and Burlington is that agree we see it that way we see this uh, electrification effort the drive to get to net zero is following in decades of leadership that the city of Burlington the Burlington Electric Department has shown first weatherizing then moving towards renewables we're the first city in the country to uh, source 100 percent of our electricity from renewable sources in 2014 and this is sort of the third big chapter in that and it's uh, it's it's very I think it's a great part of the Burlington story and I think if we can succeed at this, it will have broader implications for, for other communities. Sam, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. I have a question for the students. Okay. Great. So yeah, my, my question is just maybe like, what's one, maybe one thing that you've learned um, just through the thing, you know, the program in Burlington City and uh, Lake Brooklyn you guys took? Yeah, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I learned a lot, obviously, from that program. Um, it's really a unique experience to learn about the city, well, by being in the city. Um, I think one of the biggest things I've learned, I didn't really know anything about Burlington Electric at all. I just assumed it was like everywhere else in the country. So yeah, I, I guess one of the big things I've, I've learned is that all of our electric is sourced responsibly and sustainably, um, and that there are, I, didn't, I guess I also learned that there are, are so many um, people working really hard to, m to improve continuously so much. Yeah. 
Um, I definitely agree. I think a thing that I've learned is just like how important it is to, when trying to solve big problems, not shy away from working with each other. I think people's opinions and versatility um, is a great opportunity and it's really important to rely on each other. And I think that that's like something we should use in when like thinking about combating climate change is that we can't work alone. We have to work together. And I think that they really taught me that well. Yeah, huge takeaway was definitely working with a lot of community partners like Jen Green, who is here. <laughs> and we definitely got to meet with a ton of different people to like really dive into issues. And like I'm glad of everyone's asking questions because like in the program that we did, we had the opportunity to really like dive deeper into like what does this mean for lower income communities and like what does this mean for like different households and stuff. And so I think this program really taught me how to like combine like different issues as well, like environmental justice as well, like bringing that into all aspects of Burlington. What would your message be to maybe kids your age, you know, as it pertains to the, the importance of, you know, being at zero and the challenge of, you know, trying to be more sustainable on the planet? I guess my big message would be that you may not think that you have much of a voice or you can do much, but you really, you really can. Um, there are opportunities like this, obviously, to talk and voice your opinion and even smaller stuff as well helps even like learning about it and talking to your parents and things is really everything helps and it's good to start sooner rather than later yeah I definitely agree I just think that it's really hard to get um, not not to get caught up in like an overwhelming amount of climbing anxiety and nervousness because it's a really it's big it's really big and it's really scary and I think um, it's hard to not just put it aside and be like, well, that's a different issue and like not just kind of give up. But I think there's hope and I think relying on hope is really important and knowing that it's a really, really strong emotion. I definitely agree with Finley and Shinoa and I'd also like to bring up that like um, someone said like it isn't our fault that like the climate is like this but it will be in the future and I think we have to continue to take responsibility for all that we do to affect the climate and also take accountability to change. Yeah, thank you. Awesome, well said guys. The, the college in <coughs> Lake, uh, sorry, the city and Lake uh, semester program is really a great Burlington High School class. It's. Uh, I personally haven't got to meet uh, with you guys before this, uh, but um, uh, many other semesters, um, I have had a chance to sit down with other students that have come through the program. I know you guys, it, it's great to hear you're working with Jen Green. We really try to work closely with the program for exactly this reason. Thank you for laying that all, out, that all out. And I love the idea that you should be talking to your parents about this. My, my parents now have solar panels on there, uh, on there and, and cold climate heat pumps from those conversations. They can be uh, really make a big impact. Um, uh, Patrick. So um, we did lay out very explicit uh, numerical goals. We, uh, on an annual basis, do give updates on them. We're coming up on the annual update. What, what can we say about it? Yeah, um, yeah we have had, uh, so 2018 was the baseline for the net zero roadmap. And we had updates uh, based on the 2019, 2020, and 2021 data so far. Uh, we expect to be able to report 2022 sometime in April. Um, and we work with Synapse, which is the partner organization that helped us put the roadmap together. Uh, what we have so far relative to 2018, when we're looking at uh, thermal fossil fuel use and ground transportation, which are the two sectors that we are tracking and are the bulk of the city's uh, emissions and really the two largest sources in the state as well, is uh, we have about 12.5% reduction in 2021 relative to 2018. Uh, it was actually a little bit more in 2020 due to the pandemic reducing vehicle miles traveled. We saw a mild rebound in Burlington, uh, not as big a rebound as we saw in the rest of the country. Uh, so we're 12 and percent down relative to 2018, which is good news in any scenario, uh, and yet still not as much to be on the path to net zero as we need. Uh, so one of the things that having a net zero 2030 goal does is focuses your mind on putting everything on the table, uh, the incentives, the policies that we've been talking about here. And uh, the one uh, piece I would mention is 
a lot of the policies that were implemented already, the rental weatherization standards, uh, the renewable heating ordinance, those are just beginning to have an impact on our emissions data because they've just begun to be implemented. Uh, so we hope to see those have an impact uh, in the next several years. This set of policies would also have a significant impact uh, over you know, kind of the middle part of the decade as we see more new construction come on, we see some buildings go through the permitting process. Um, uh, our rough, rough estimate is that Burlington Electric's incentives can do about 25% of the work that we need to get to net zero 2030. So policies like this, projects like the District Energy Project and other big initiatives are gonna have to help fill the gap along with support from the state and federal government. <coughs> go ahead, Pike. So uh, I would say that that's a very incomplete picture uh, when we come to McNeil, because uh, with biomass or with wood chips, the accounting can't just be what's going up in terms of the stack. We have to look at the whole life cycle. And the difference for us between fossil fuels and wood, uh, particularly local wood like we have with McNeil, is with local wood, you can manage forests sustainably, you can regrow trees, you can re-sequester carbon. And the data we have for Burlington Electric suggests that in the areas where we harvest, in Vermont and New York, since 2003, we've been adding net tree carbon. Uh, so we're adding sequestration, not losing sequestration. With fossil fuels, you're taking carbon that's been stored geologically for millions of years, putting it in the atmosphere with no plan to ever re-sequester it. There's no commercial carbon capture and sequestration technology that I'm aware of uh, for coal plants or gas plants or oil. With, with wood chips, uh, we have the opportunity, if we are sustainable, and we have four foresters at McNeil that work on this every day, uh, to make sure that we're managing our properties sustainably, we can have a life cycle that is beneficial. And I think that's a critical piece. And for the state of Vermont, uh, looking at modern wood, advanced wood heating, which can be very efficient, uh, is an option for a number of households in terms of getting off of fossil fuels. I think in Burlington, we have very, very little in the way of wood heating uh, for the residential scale. I think most households are on natural gas or are looking at heat pumps. Uh, so we don't really have a lot of it here. We don't necessarily expect to have a lot of wood heating in Burlington, but it is an option among many options for buildings to look at. And that's part of the policy is to make sure if it's renewable, we can include it in the policy. If I contact you, can I get the sequestration data that you're referencing? I think I've already shared it with you, uh, but it's in our, it's publicly available. It's in our IRP from 2020. Uh, if you go to the Burlington Electric website, go to the forms and reports page, look at our 2020 integrated resource plan, there is an appendices and on page 88, is data from the Innovative Natural Resource Solutions Group, which suggests that since 2003, in the forests in New York and Vermont, we have been adding net tree carbon. That's a third party analysis. So I want our question over here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you had said that this policy will be up for vote in March. Are you feeling optimistic that residents will favor this? <clears throat> I, am, uh, I am hopeful. Um, the Burlington voters have already weighed in on this um, concept once, and approximately 65% of voters voted yes once. Um, there was, and, and we had a lot of uh, discussion in the lead up to that vote that we were likely to take the policy in this direction. Uh, so this isn't a wholly new conversation. This, what is different now is that, that we've worked out the details of how, um, how the policy is going to work, and uh, but uh, you know Burlington voters again and again have shown the support that, that, that Burlington voters again and again have said they want us moving aggressively in this direction in a number of ways. Uh, the, the most recent uh, ballot initiative on this um, was just uh, just a year ago, right there, and where we went for the um, net zero uh, revenue bonds and. Uh, approximately 70% um, of the voters supported that. So we, we think that there is strong support for climate action at the local level in Burlington. Um, and uh, people will have a chance to demonstrate that starting in just, a, just a few, three weeks here. I saw a question over here. Go ahead.
Yeah, it's a great question. And I, mean, I think Bill was trying to communicate that um, to agree this involves, you know, we already have a robust permitting system to agree that this is sort of an additional step in the permitting system. Uh, his team is going to be there, be as customer friendly and supportive as, as possible in, in that part of it. Um, uh, we have seen the industry uh, adopting uh, these technologies very rapidly already um, between what's required, uh, between the incentives and what's required out of the various the energy codes and then the, 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 the uh, uh, primary heat regulation we're already put in place. Um, uh, at, at this point, you know, we, I, I don't think we are seeing real workforce shortages, you know, we, we had a, a different policy, let's say, with uh, the, um, we have a requirement that existing buildings bring themselves up to energy code, and there we had a real concern about uh, the um, specialized workforce being there to do that kind of air sealing and insulation, um, and just the, the size of that industry being able to meet all of these apartments that needed to be upgraded, and so there we really phased in the policy. Um, there is some aspect of this policy, there's one specific piece that gets phased in uh, because of our, more because we're we, we're looking forward to the technology in a specific area. What is it? The, uh, the, water heating. The water heating. In multifamily buildings. So, so multifamily hot water heating, the technology is not quite there yet to be competitive on the electric side. So we're giving that, that doesn't get kick in for a couple extra years. Beyond that, um, we think the industry can 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 work start working with this policy starting in 24 as long as you know it's communicated well and they have some time to get uh, to ramp up to it. Another question. Hey Sam. Yeah. Three three categories: all new buildings, then existing buildings, but only existing buildings that are bigger than 50,000 square feet. And in that, with the, that category, it's not that all existing buildings have to go out and do all this work right away. It's at the time when they are replacing their existing systems. That's when the requirement kicks in. So, boiler needs to be replaced. That's when that's when there would be they would need to do analysis of uh, are they going to put in a conventional system and pay a fee, or are they going to put in the electric uh, option? Um, <clears throat> and then the third category is city buildings. So um, for uh, almost all the policy kicks in at the beginning of 2024, there, the, like I was just saying a moment ago, multifamily, so you know, apartment buildings with m multiple households living uh, in apartments, um, the hot water system for 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 the for those types of buildings, the requirement would not get, start until 2026, the beginning of 2026. Great, appreciate all the questions. It's uh, great that you all came out. So grateful again to all of you for being part of this and for, for standing with us um, at this important moment. And uh, look forward to talking to everyone a lot more between now and town meeting day. Thank you.